Welcome to our Prophetic Perspective Podcast. I'm Reinhard Stander. Today with me is Marlon Ming. Welcome, Marlon. Hey, welcome, Reinhard. How yeah, are you? I'm blessed. Amen. Now, today we have a w- exciting topic, but yes. also an intense topic, and it's called Preterism's Push for a Theocracy. This is Podcast 13 of Season 1. And speaking of theocracy, what does theocracy mean? Yeah. The Oxford Dictionary gives us a definition. It is a system of government in which priests rule in the name of God Hmm. or a God. The commonwealth of Israel from the time of Moses until the election of Saul as king was under a theocracy. So God ruled directly his people. And so this push for theocracy means that these people want to place God back in government, but also God's law, and then rule God, having God rule through the government, everyone, you know, in this country, and then globally, Mm. according to God's laws. And we're going to look at that danger in a moment. So our overview is first world events, then people's perspective, then theological perspective, then prophetic perspective, and then perspective of hope. Section one world events so now for our world events we're looking at this really left-wing article the title of it is secrets of the extreme religious right inside the frightening world of christian reconstructionism so basically Mm -hmm. this is a far left publication like i said before and they have ample reasons to you know think that you know, Christianity is extreme and not worth following because of this Christian reconstructionism. Mm. And um, Mm. unfortunately, they take, you know, this really extreme perspective Mm. and Mm. they lump all of Christianity Mm. in it. So now this other uh, article says how a fringe theocratic movement helps shape the religious right as we know know it. Yeah, so they are even involved in politics quite a bit. Yes. And, you know, secular publications are picking up on this. Now the Oxford Handbooks Online defines uh, this idea of Christian Reconstructionism. And it says, for more than half a century, Rahusas John Rushdumi and his followers have articulated and disseminated what they understand to be the biblical worldview. Based in aspects of traditional reform theology and both the Old and the New Testament, this worldview seeks to apply biblical law to every aspect of life and to, ref- and to, and to transform every aspect of culture to establish the kingdom of God. While some components of their visions are so extreme that Christian Reconstructionists are often dismissed as an irrelevant fringe group. Other aspects of their vision have taken root in conservative American Protestantism, especially in the Christian homeschool movement, and therefore influenced American conservatism more broadly. Yeah, you know, and speaking about that Christian homeschool movement is that Rajduni was one of the main proponents that actually helped made it law that people could homeschool their own children. Mm. But he had other agendas. Right. And that is why they mentioned this, because he had an agenda of establishing God's kingdom here on earth. And Mm. to him, even in his writings, he says, if you want to influence people, you need to go to education. And so he knew it couldn't get through public schooling or just private schooling if his books could be disseminated, you know, into homes, homes, then moms and dads believing this could influence their children. Mm. And so, you know, uh, we are not against homeschooling. You know, I believe in homeschooling. I was homeschooled. And so, but what we see here is that there's this push for a theocracy. And what better way than doing it through the churches and through homeschools and getting into people's homes. And this is quite a problem. Christian Reconstructionist and Dominionism, Theocratic Pursuit in American Politics. Mm. This article was published in The Conversation. In Moscow, Idaho, conservative Christians, Reconstructionists, are thriving amid evangelical turmoil. So this is not just some little offshoot group. This is growing all across America. And... um, You know, so if it was just a little group, it wouldn't be so yep. bad. But this yep. is a dangerous situation Absolutely. because it's, it's, it's picking up traction. Uh, we wouldn't have spent time on this, you know, if this is this wasn't a danger. 
and coming to all people on all places, especially in this country. Mm. Section two, people's perspective. Anything else in my life. When I became a Christian, I just thought, I would be able to encapsulate that vision thing because everybody else would have had that vision thing as well. And I would redirect it in building the kingdom of God. But I just noticed a lot of people didn't have the vision thing of someone who had a vision and put it into practice. I mean, that is something that, unfortunately, a lot of Christians out there have no conception of. So in order to understand how to develop this vision, you've got to have the basic principles that are, I believe our founders had in the development of what makes a Christian vision work and for the transformation of, this, of, of the world in which we live. And Dr. Gary North wrote the following to me in an email about Chambers' introduction. I want you to listen to this. Because in essence, faith without works is dead. Having a vision is important, and that's a fundamental step, but not working that vision is a problem. It's not the Christian worldview. And here's what Gary North wrote to me in, in that email. Whitaker Chambers' introduction was powerful. It was one of the most wrong-headed pieces of literature ever written. You know, if you know Gary North, you understand you know, Gary North at this point. He said, he felt that he was joining the losing side when he became a Christian. He was a pietist. I hope I'm not going to offend anybody by the next one. A millennial and a retreatist of the first order who was consistent with what he said he believed about joining the losing side. He retreated to a farm and stopped writing. And this is my, my words next. Instead of moving to a small town in Idaho with the ironic name Moscow to start a school publishing company, K-12 school, a national school movement, and a college. And a perpetual thorn in the side of a lot of people. This is what we were called to do. For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of, uh, glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations will worship before you, for the kingdom is the Lord's, and he rules over the nations. And the Lord will be king over all the earth, and, the, and in that day the Lord will be the only one, and his name the only one. The meek shall inherit the earth. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And Jesus said, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Now all those passages that I cited, you all know. But I believe we have confined those passages to a supra-spiritual realm alone. Uh, uh, battling back and forth with this fellow uh, on Facebook was asking me questions about things. I had written an article about um, the, uh, the, the, the fallacy of the, uh, the earth is not your home. And I got some real criticism from people. Are you saying that the earth is, is our home? I said, yeah, yeah, of course it is. Where do you go at night? You go, you go to your home. <laughs> the earth is your home. I said, we have, we have multiple citizenship. We have dual citizenship. I, my my uh, two sons and I, have, uh, uh, we're, we're, we have Italian citizenship as well. I got two citizenships. This is our home. God created this world to do stuff with. And yet, if you talk with a lot of people, they don't have any regard. They're in a temporary situation down here. There's like staying at the motel. You know, you, believe the, you leave the, the towels on the floor, you put them down here, you don't care about making the bed and all that kind of stuff because it's not your room. This is our home right now. And God put us here for this worldly purposes, for this worldly goals, for this worldly visions to be worked. Our founders understood there were certain fundamental, as, uh, uh, fundamental assumptions about reality that make the world work the way it does. 
You, if you don't follow those uh, operating assumptions and you try to live inconsistent with those operating assumptions, you will not last in this world. And there are probably a thousand or more examples of that's the case. I mean, in our, our own culture today in terms of, of, of economics, you don't, you don't follow oikonomics, the lawful ordering of a household. That's what the word oikonomics is all about. Oikos, house, nomos, law. The oikonomics of the household, and the household not just being where you live, but God's house. You don't follow those rules, you're going to end up in bankruptcy. Is that vision requires a future and action. Uh, as you, many of you may know, I write on the area of eschatology, and I've always said that eschatology matters. What a person believes about the future determines how he will live in the present and plan and work in the future. And we have today, we've been stymied by this idea that we are living in the last days. Uh, Jesus is coming back soon. The rapture is right around the corner. You can't change anything that's going on today. Uh, uh, why rearrange the deck chairs on the Titanic? Uh, you've heard these things over and over and over again. When you have a shortened view of the future, you give, chance, you give the chance to other people to co-opt the future while we sit back and do anything. Section 3, Theological Perspective. Our guest on today's podcast is Clifford Goldstein. He is an ordained minister and a prolific writer. He has authored more than 20 books, and many of, of them on Christian and theological subjects, and also some of them on prophetic subjects. And so today, you know, we're going to ask him about theocracy. And so thank you so much for coming onto the podcast, Cliff. Glad to be here. So, you know, why is... Um, dominionism, or some people call it reconstructionism. You know, why is it growing among evangelicals? You know, and what is this danger to the country? You know, especially to the USA, with this agenda to establish a theocracy. You know, in the country. Well, you know, historically, uh, theocracies generally don't work too well unless God Himself is the theos. Okay, God looking, you even saw the trouble God had. You even saw the trouble he had with his people. Okay, and so now you get rid of him and you put humans in the place of God. You're looking for trouble. You know, the bottom line is, you know, people want order in their life. They want stability. They, and when things start falling apart, and my goodness, if they were you know, you look through history, every age, people thought it was terrible, it was immoral, things were falling apart. Well, man, uh, compared to what's going on now, uh, back then, it was peaches and cream. And so there is just this tendency, you know, Christians have good reasons for believing in what we believe and for believing the truth of the gospel and the truth of Jesus. And, and we we're given a way to live, a way of life. And there is this natural tendency to want to bring stability to society, to end the crime, to end the, the, the poverty, to end the things. And so there is this temptation of power. Hey, we're Christians. We've got the Bible. God is on our side. Let us order society in the right way. And, uh, and unfortunately, any time that's really been tried, it generally doesn't work well. I mean, someone was saying Christian is a fine person until the moment you give them political power. In fact, I, had a, I have a friend, uh, a good Christian man, very wealthy African-American businessman, just incredibly successful fella, amazing guy. And he was going to run for them. And he ran actually for mayor of a big city, ended up coming in second, which for a just newcomer was quite good. And I had warned him. I said, you watch, because, you know, he's a Christian. And he, I know he wanted to become the mayor of the city to bring morality and to do good. And, and I believe he would have been a fine mayor would have done the city some good. 
But I remember I warned him. I said, brother, I used to study this stuff a lot. And historically, when Christians go into power, into politics, with the idea of purifying the politics, and in nine out of 10 cases, the politics instead ends up corrupting the Christian. Hmm. Okay, they get political power. Politics is the art of compromise. You got to compromise. You got to give. You got and, and so on. And you don't want to really compromise in Christianity, at least on certain principles. And after it was all over, I asked him, "Did you think about what I what I said?" He said, "I saw it every day, every day, just running." So the bottom line is, things are bad. Mm. They've always, to a certain degree, been bad, but they're really bad now, mm. and they're pushing an extreme. Mm. It's, it's, it's fine to want to bring Christian values to a certain degree to politics, but these people aren't just talking about that. They're talking about, you know, establishing a theocracy with God's biblical law. And uh, as I said in the beginning, it wasn't easy for God himself to do it. And you're going to get humans claiming to be, to, to, to try to do it. So it has always been in the past a recipe for disaster. Mm. And I have no reason to think were something like this to happen again, it would be anything but a disaster in the future. Oh, that makes sense. That really makes sense. Now, just a bonus question before we end, Cliff. Um, the Bible says God's law is holy, just, and good. So what is wrong for Christians to... Uh, to try and enforce God's law when they have political power? Well, I guess it, well, in one sense, there's nothing wrong. There's nothing wrong in, in one sense, you know, to, we do that anyway. Thou shall not kill, thou shall not steal. I mean, you get, you know, they typically divide the man, the first four man's duty to God, the last six man's duty to man. But I don't see the wisdom of the state telling you you can't covet or to honor your mother and your father. But I think the bottom line in the end is God himself doesn't force us to follow his laws. He gives us, we have to face the consequences for violating them. Mm -hmm. So when humans start going in and trying to push God's law, again, we, I, I'm glad there's laws against stealing. Yes. I'm glad there's laws against murder. But these are not necessarily just God's law. You can find this in non-Christian. So there's certain inter, interlapping of the two that they could enforce. But try to enforce the fourth commandment. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the other thing, too, what day do you think they would enforce? Mm -hmm. they, you know, it's kind of funny. I tell people the United States Constitution doesn't even mention God. Okay. doesn't mention God. It's, the whole point is to restrict religion. But the one time they get bring religion in is it says that if Congress passes a law or the president, or Congress passes a law, they send it to the president. He has 10 days to sign it. Sunday's accepted. Okay, so they're building in the, 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 this ancient, the time in America when Sunday is the Lord's day. Mm. And they're building that in. That's built into the Constitution itself. And yet, from my perspective, the one time they're trying to promote God's law, they don't get it right. They don't get it right. So you do have the problem of men trying to promote God's will and God's law, when a lot of times it seems like they don't know what God's will is. And that can cause, it's bad enough enforcing God's will on people. But then enforcing something that is not God's will and enforcing it as if it is God's will, oof, that's a real recipe for unmitigated disaster. Yeah, the moment you try and to enforce, especially the first four laws, you know, with our relationship towards God and you know, how to worship, when to worship, you know, that becomes a problem. And that, that really makes sense what you're saying there. Cliff, thank you so much for your time coming onto the podcast. Really appreciate it, man. Sure. Glad to 
Do it. Have fun. Now, may, God, may God bless you. Yeah, take care. Bye-bye. Section 4. Prophetic Perspective. As we come to our prophetic perspective, you know, let's just quickly look at that graph again of partial preterism. We saw that they put all the prophecies into the far past in the author's day and have a little bit of future in the very far future removed from all history where they believe Jesus would come maybe someday. But you know, it is so far removed that who knows whenever that would be. But here is something we need to observe to lay the foundation for today's study. In between hmm. uh, the fulfilled prophecies and the very far future that they even say is thousands of years, wow. th- th- this period in between, that's the historical period or the period we live in, the church establishes God's kingdom on earth during Christ's millennial reign in heaven as king. And so they believe we are living now in the millennium, this prophetic, because all the prophecies have been fulfilled of Revelation already, and then it's the millennium in Revelation 20. So we are in the millennium now. Right. And Jesus is reigning in the millennium through us. Hmm. And so they believe it's a spiritual millennium. It's not exactly ten, big, uh, a thousand years because there's already 2,000 years or right. more or less. And so to them, it is a spiritual millennium and God will reign through us. And so this reigning, what does this mean? Now listen very, very carefully. Partial preterism argues for a forever continuation of history where even the final coming of Christ, of which David Chilton declares there are still thousands of years to go to the second coming, will just be a further continuation of world history. To them, there is no end to history. Hmm. Okay, uh, there's, there's no scripture to them that says, oh, history will end or this world will end. But what about scripture? The Bible says in 2 Peter 3.10, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. up. Now yeah. you tell me something left. No, it's burned no, up. It's, it's, the, this world comes to an end. It will end. It will end. But... What does the preterist say about this text? Stan Newton interprets 2 Peter 3.10, which has traditionally been understood to indicate an end in time and of history, to mean the opposite. He concludes that the idea of God bringing an end to history has no basis in Scripture. Mercy. Why? Because they spiritualize everything and preterize it. Preterism argues for a world that does not degenerate, but rather improves over time. Brother, the no, world is just getting just, better. It's getting progressively worse every <laughs> year. Uh. Not according to preterism. Stan no. Newton states that the church is not coming to its end and ridicules futurists that object to a present and growing kingdom. People who conclude that the world is heading towards apostasy and judgment. So they're making fun mm. of people saying the world is yeah. going to end, it's getting worse, right. they are just getting better. But here's the problem. They in 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 the early in the early twentieth century, this is now nineteen hundreds as it began. Right. There was this this idea, um, especially in the Western world, that man, everything is just getting better and better. There was this surge of technology, so electricity and right. cars. Then the Wright brothers with planes, and then First World War hit. Mm. And the whole West was like in an identity crisis because we thought the world is getting better. And all these preachers that said the world is just getting better was like distraught. Mm. And then after this First World War, slowly things recovered and they, they started again with their philosophy. Everything's getting better. And then the Second World War. Mm. And for years, uh, this, uh, all these theories and beliefs and philosophies went downhill and didn't grow at all. But then again from the 60s until the 2000s, it just grew and grew and grew. Gotcha. Um, and it's still growing. But recently, you know, uh, there's this question in the air, um, even amongst them, you know. Is the world really getting better? But they believe it because it's their philosophy. Right. But every time there's this world, world crisis, they are confronted with their own belief that doesn't make sense. Right. And if you look at morality, that's getting worse oh. progressively over over the last hundred years. It's oh. just crazy. Now, Stan Newton emphatically declares that our world is not ending. Mm. He's a Christian and he says, brother, you are this wrong. The it. world is not ending. Peter was wrong. 
Peter is wrong. Mm -hmm. Micah yeah. Stevens concurs that since the world isn't doomed to get worse, it has the potential of becoming better. Okay, so that what they say is, you won't find in the Bible that the world will end. So that means that the world won't get bad to the state of ending itself. So it will get better. What what mm. type of reasoning? Because yes. Revelation eleven eighteen says the the destroyers of the earth. We will, will have the destroyed. capability to destroy ourselves, right. but they don't see it in Scripture. Mm -hmm. And he says, we have the potential to make that happen. So they believe that the answer to make the world even a better place is with Christians. Make it and we are, with our own works, going to make this a better place. Now, J. Marcellus Kirk, also a preterist, says, However improbable, it may seem that the whole world should be Christianized. We know that God is able to perform what He has promised. Mm. And so that is why they want to... This is different than evangelism. We, we want to spread God's word and His invitation. It's right. an invitation where people can make a choice. Right. They want to forcefully Force convert They're the whole make world. It happen. Be it Buddhism or Islam or whoever it is. This is what they want to do. Instead of acknowledging that history is moving toward an end... Preterism proposes that Christianity will gain a complete triumph over all false religions. Mm. And the visible kingdom of Satan will be destroyed. And so to them, is they're going to destroy all the other religions. It will only be Christians that will rule. Now, this sounds like an echo from Revelation 13. Where Revelation 13 warns that there yes. will be a lamb-like power right. that will force the world to go along with its agenda yes. and to worship the image of the beast. And what do we see? We see Christians with a focus of destroying all other religions and mm -hmm. setting up Christianity as the sole religion. Or, as Newton assures us, Victorious eschatology or end time events teaches the continual growth of the messianic kingdom until all the nations of the world have been discipled. Mm. And so there will be only one religion and only one world religion, Christianity. But what type of Christianity? Exactly. Whose Christianity will be prevailing? Exactly. Yeah. You know, will it be the one of Jesus saying, you know, come ye to me, you know, all, all you who are weary, you know, mm -hmm. invitation or one where there will be dominance and force. Right. According to Harold Eberle, the pinnacle of preterist eschatology is the view that the kingdom of God will grow and advance until it fills the earth. So the preterist focus is therefore not on the second coming of Jesus as the final victory over the kingdom of evil, but rather on the church that is establishing God's kingdom here on earth by the preaching of the gospel. Instead of the expected advent of Christ, the church is magnified as bringing about God's victory. And so there's mm. this total switch, this total twisting. The focus is no longer Jesus that has this victory. It is now the church. It's us as the people that's going to be having this victory and crushing all other religions. Now, Kenneth Gentry uh, confirms this when he claims, contrary to popular opinion today, Jesus discourages us from awaiting his kingdom as if he were going to establish it at his glorious visible second coming. Can what? you believe that? Yeah. And he, reached, he, he writes this in his new book, you know, the book of Revelation made easy. Um, on this first page, is, uh, on, on page 111, and he says there, you know, because he goes through the details of the second coming and the people believes. And then he comes and says, you know, really? Jesus discourages us from awaiting his kingdom. As mm -hmm. if he were going to establish it at his glorious visible second coming. Because he's a preterist. And there's no hope in Jesus coming someday to, 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 to establish his kingdom. Mm -hmm. We are the hope. We are our own hope to establish God's kingdom. Now we have dominionism. The danger of this theology is that it leads to dominionism, mm. this, part, this, this partial preterism. Partial preterists believe that Christians must take control over most of the secular institutions in the world and become politically active. Mm. So post-millennial George Grant unequivocally states, Christians have an obligation, a mandate 
a commission, a holy responsibility to reclaim the land for Jesus Christ, to have dominion in civil structures, just as in every other aspect of life and godliness. But it is a dominion we are after, not just a voice. It is a dominion we are after, not just influence. It is dominion we are after, not just equal time. It is dominion we are after, world conquest. That's what Christ has commissioned us to accomplish. Mm. We must win the world with the power of the gospel, and we must never settle for anything less. Thus, Christian politics has as its primary intent the conquest of the land, of, man's, of men, families, institutions, bureaucracies, courts and governments for the kingdom of God. Yeah, that's just shocking. Yeah. That's just shocking. It's like you can't read that or listen to those words and not be shocked. Yeah, it is. That this is the agenda and aim of reconstructionists or yeah. dominionists Dominism. or partial predators, however you want to term them. Right. It's like they want to take over the country, but not over the country, every other institution and control everything mm. for right. Jesus. Mm. That that is just incredible. It's almost like we have not learned from history. Yeah. It's almost yes. like what about the dark ages? Yeah, the dark ages and uh, you know, people fleeing to America, the founding mm -hmm. fathers fleeing to America mm -hmm. for this uh idea that they can have freedom from religious mm -hmm. extremism mm -hmm. extremism mm -hmm. and from you know the government controlling the people yes. and not giving you yes. the right to have yes. you know to 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 express your religious convictions mm -hmm. based on your con your conscience yes. Uh, yes but it's like we're in that, like we're not learning we're going in that same loop again yes and this is the spirit of antichrist right because we want to force christianity onto others right this is not the will of jesus this push for dominion is also known as reconstructionism or theonomy and has very specific movements like the new apostolic reformation it's termed reconstructionism for they seek to reconstruct society according to the christian norms it's also called theonomy for it focuses on the place of biblical law to guide society. Oh, that's dangerous. According to Trevor Origio, this is no fringe movement, but a rapid institutionalized entity larger than most Protestant de de denomination. Randy Terry states that the goal is a Christian nation. We have a biblical duty. We are called by God to conquer this country. Oh, so this is this is man. the perspective that they're having and agendas that you're pushing. Now, dominionism has three pillars mm. that we're going to look at. Satan usurps man's dominion over the earth through the temptation of Adam and Eve. Mm. The church is God's institution to take dominion back from Satan. Jesus cannot come or will not return until the church has taken dominion by gaining control of the earth's government and societal institutions. So these are mm. what they believe and uh, and this is the agenda that mm. they are bringing forth. And and there's nothing wrong with the first but right. Satan did usurp our did. dominion and God's dominion from the earth. Mm -hmm. But Jesus came He's to the take one. the dominion yes. back, not the church. No. Jesus took it when he died on the, the cross. cross. That's right. And Jesus himself will bring an end to this world's governments um, when he comes as that rock hitting the Cut image it. on the yeah. feet and just smashing it to pieces. Not the church taking dominion for mm. Jesus. Right. That is not biblical. That is not. Now, this dominionism will lead to a theocracy. If they have their say. And brother, this is exactly what we find in Revelation. Now in the future, we're going to study Revelation. But this is exactly what we find. When we get to Revelation chapter 13, in the first part from verse 1 to 10, we see this Antichrist beast. Now in a previous podcast, we've identified it as the papal system, so the Roman Catholic system, with the Pope as, it is, as its head. But then in verse 11 to verse 18, yes. we have this uh, this beast from the earth. The mm -hmm. Bible says in verse 11, And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. Now we're going to discover in the future that this beast 
is is the power of America. It yeah, is it's the, the USA, and it is it's it's lamb like. It was founded on Christian principles, democratic principles. We can see there's a there's a good constitution, etc. But the voice, the laws, is draconian, and Christians. Mm. What will they do? Verse twelve. And he exercises all the power of the first beast before him and causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. And so what is going to happen, Christians in this nation is going to do exactly, they're going to mirror Yes. Exactly what happened during the Dark Ages. They're going to utilize the power of the Antichrist mm-hmm. and they're going to force everyone to have God's government and laws back into society, just as it was in the Dark Ages. So they would basically force everyone to worship the Antichrist again. And this, with maybe all of them doesn't even know this, but this is where it is leading. It's heading they are, They are sowing the seed and people are believing this. And if you think this is a fringe movement it is not it's no. growing rapidly and even many christians and all denominations are, are are busy getting this i'm going to call it wine because yes. revelation that's the word says it is. it's wine it's yes. the wine of intoxication it mm-hmm. is false teachings and christians in all denominations even in my denominations are believing these teachings why mm. because they see Oh, secularism, humanism, all these things are happening in the world and the morality is failing. Right. We need God more and faith back in society. And now they're setting themselves up to go along with this teaching and this doctrine. And what will be the end result? Prophecy will be fulfilled where they want a theocracy back as it was in the Old Testament and it was in the Dark Ages. And they will prepare the stage for the Antichrist. And so here's what they believe. David Chilton states that Christianity is ultimately the dominant culture. Mm. Predestined to be the final and universal religion. The church will fill the earth. Mm. And so this is, this is what they want. And so instead of let's preach the gospel of Jesus, right. the focus is the church, the church, this dogma, and we will be the dominant culture and we will fill the earth. Now, Greg Banson, this proposed Christian state should rule by God's law, according to Greg Banson, where it should be enforced by the civil magistrate, mm. where and how the stipulation of God so designate. So Greg Banson proposed that we should get the police involved. Right. And if you don't want to worship like we dictate, you will go to jail. But you will worship as we tell you how to. Isn't that mm. just That's, incredible? Yeah. And this is exactly what the Bible tells us. It says here in verse 15, He had power to give life under the image of the beast. That's correct. That the image of the beast should both speak, speak and, and cause. Voice. That's force. Right. And cause that as many who would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. So if you don't want to go along, first will be prison sentence. Eventually there will be executions. Because what will they do? They will go back to biblical law. Now Gary DeMar, uh, North, they all have written extensive writings where they show how biblical law should be be put into society. Mm. Even the laws of Leviticus oh, wow. and Deuteronomy and where there will be the death penalty if you don't worship according to the law of the state, which is God's law now. Right. It's like, this is just incredible. Now, Gary North argues that the Bible requires an international theocracy. Where Do you see this? International. So this is where the Bible says in verse 16, He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right and on their foreheads. This means it's international. Everyone globally. That's why God's message goes global in chapter 14. That's correct. Because this beast and the lamb-like beast does this globally. So it first happens in this country, in the USA, and then it's going to span out to the whole world. Mm -hmm. It says... argues that the Bible requires an international theocracy where every individual as well as every nation is under God's sovereign rule. And I'm going to tell you, according to Bible prophecy, this will be the law, how the Antichrist system would dictate it. Right. That law we found in the Catholic Bible. Remember when we had the Catholic Bible there? That will be the law 
applied to everyone and forced onto everyone. Uh, Raj Dooney, now he was one of the great proponents. He did this now for many years. He died a while ago, but he he helped establish all these principles that are really just rapidly increasing in growth across this country. He said there can be no tolerance. Wow. Now this is what we see in chapter 13. There's, right. no tolerance. There's no tolerance. In a low system for another religion. Now this would include all other Christian religions too, all right. different denominations that don't go along with their system. Yep. So if you believe differently, yep. you'll be killed, you'll be persecuted. Toleration yeah. is a device used to introduce a new law system as a prelude to a new intolerance. Mm. Every law system must maintain its existence by hostility to every other law system and to alien religious foundations or else it commits suicide. So he says, if there's not force, mm. if there's going to be tolerance, we can't exist. So the moment we get into power, we won't have tolerance. Isn't that incredible? Yeah. The moment we get into power, we won't have tolerance. We will enforce it and make sure that no other system can exist or other religious foundations mm. or alien religious foundations. This sounds like uh, communism, but with a religious... On steroids. Yeah. They, they are so against communism, but right. they're going to they're gonna do the exact same thing, just but 10 just, times worse. Yeah. The state is a bankrupt institution. This is now Rajduni speaking. The only alternative to this bankrupt humanistic system is a God-centered government. And this is exactly what more Christians, more Christians are feeling globally, but especially in this country. Oh man, we can just feel the pressure of all the immorality and the Right. You, can't even, the, you can't even mention all the evil right. and the darkness. And so they say, so what is the solution? Here's the solution. A God-centered government. And so something is going to break somewhere and Christians are going to be so fed up. They're going to say, until here and no further, we are taking a stand and God is going to be back in government and we want a theocracy. Mm. And all these seeds will ha have been planted in, in people's minds and the stage is set. The only true order is founded on biblical law, according to Rashduni. All law is religious in nature. And every non-biblical law order represents an anti-Christian religion. Mm. And so they see everything opposing Christianity. And therefore, we will impose Christianity. And so to them, the only law order that matters is biblical law. So they basically want to impose biblical law. But this is not God's way of doing no. things. Have never been. And they are actually on the track of fulfilling Bible, Bible prophecy. prophecy. We have been warned. Yes. What will be our response? Rashtuni says, Few things are more commonly misunderstood than the nature and meaning of theocracy. Because people have questioned this. Are you crazy? What, right. what are you meaning? He said, no, 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 you're misunderstanding. This is what I mean with theocracy. It is commonly assumed to be a dictatorship dictatorial rule by self-appointed men who claim to rule for God. Now, he's now he's doing a straw man argument here. Mm. In reality, theocracy in biblical law is the closest thing to a radical libertarianism that can be had. Hmm. But yet, he just said there's no tolerance. It should right. be enforced. So, yeah, you would have liberty if you go along with the system. Exactly. But if you don't want to believe what they subscribe, and for instance, if they say you should worship on this day, you should worship this way, you don't want to go along, you don't have any choice. What liberty is that? That's not liberty. That's not liberty. So, this is just a straw man argument. But he's acknowledging they want a theocracy totally, like it was in the Old Testament or in the Dark Ages. Rajduni says the first and basic duty of the state is to further the kingdom of God. Did you ever hear mm. that? Not the church, not, <laughs> not the saints, not Christians. Now, not the and now the government's responsibility to further yeah. God's kingdom. This is just crazy. By recognizing the sovereignty of God and his word and conforming itself to the law word of God, the state thus has a duty to be what? Christian. Christian. It must be Christian, even as man, the family, the church, the school, and all things else must be Christian. To hold otherwise is to assert the death of God in the sphere of the state. Mm. And so no one will 
change these people's minds. This is where they're headed. This is where their goal and agenda is headed. This is why they're sowing the seeds all over. Their books are all over to be found. And their publications. And this is just spreading rampantly. Because now news commentators that are more conservative of nature, Christians all over, are saying the same thing. We must get back to God. Mm. We, we, we must find morality again in society. We can't go on like this. Where is this going to end? Mm. and something is going to happen and the Bible warned us about this and so the question is where will we be found at the end of the spectrum section 5 perspective of hope so now for the perspective of hope we're going to look at 7 points that the Bible teaches in regards to God and government and, um, and we're going to look at you know what the Bible teaches yes. regarding you know government so the first one is God is sovereign over all governments. Yes. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. That's taken from Psalms chapter 33, verse 8. Amen. So this is what the Bible teaches. Now we're going to go to Colossians 1, verse 16. It says uh, at, the, at the end there, Whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. Amen. Colossians again 1 verse 16 so God's sovereign over all government let's just establish that so God yes. doesn't need uh, humans <laughs> to to play God in order no. to rule the world no we don't have to you know be a president or sit in Congress you know yes. to shine God's light yeah and so we don't say God cannot do it God has Daniel in government God has his people all over That's but right. he's in control of government we don't have to come together and, and form whatever we want to and put God back in government. God is in control of governments, even if it is secular, even if it's against God. Mm. God is still sovereign. He's still sovereign. The second principle is God is in control of governmental structures. John 19, 11, Jesus answered and told Pilate, Thou couldst have no power at all against me, right. except it were given thee from above. Therefore, he that delivered me unto thee had the greater sin. And so Jesus says, you know, God's in control. Yeah. And so you don't have any power over me. Except Whatever. what God has given. Romans 13.1 says, Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. For there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. And that's why the Bible says in Daniel, we have, yes. we have looked at this verse, God yeah. setteth up kings. Exactly. God takes them down. And the context of that was when uh, these Israelites were in captivity yes, yes. under, you know, which w a Babylonian king, mm -hmm. which would have been, you know, appear to be brutal to God's mm -hmm. people. Yep. And even in that circumstances, God Amen. allowed it. Amen. Now, Christians should respect and obey civil authority. Mm -hmm. Romans 13, 2 says, Whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God, and they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. Amen. So God is calling us to be law-abiding citizens. Amen. Obviously, wherever the law of the land is not oppressing or not going against mm -hmm. the laws of yes. God. Amen. Amen. The fourth principle is Christians should pray. For those in civil authority, even right. if you don't like them, pray. Yeah. First Timothy 2 verse 1 to 2 says, I exhort therefore that first of all supplications, prayers, intercessions and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. And so when we pray, when we are at church, we pray for the leaders of the country. That's correct. We pray for nations. Yes. We pray that God will be with them, that God will intervene yes. and intercede. Now, the next pillar that we're going to look at is this idea that Christians shouldn't let government interfere in God's dominion. Mm -hmm. In Mark 12, verse 17, the Bible says, And Jesus answering said unto them, Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. Mm. And they marveled at him. Amen. So here Jesus is teaching yes. that keep civil stuff civil, yes. and Christian, biblical, religious, godly mm -hmm. things godly. Mm. And, uh, and, and these two should never no. be married. Because when that happens, yes. we can have chaos. And yeah. we have a lot of history to show us Absolutely. that this, these extreme um, religious... Mm governmental oppression that's happening happened mm. throughout the dark ages there should be a separation between state and church 
That's correct. You know, between our Christian living and politics. The, the Bible is very clear about that. And then the next principle, Christians should obey God above government. That's right. Acts 5.29 says, Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than, than men. Man. And the principle here is that, just as you referred to earlier, if the government, with some law, goes against my conscience, I should be more obedient to God than to government. So right. I, I'm, I'm an obedient citizen, and you know I, I, I go along. I acknowledge their powers from God, yes. but when against w- goes against my conscience or how I believe the Word of God is telling me, then I should be rather obeying God than man. The next point is that all governments will end and Jesus will Amen. reign forever. In Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6 and 7 says, For unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. Mm -hmm. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it and with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever the zeal of the lord of hosts will perform this Amen. so all governments will end and jesus will reign forever praise now the lord. thank you guys for tuning into the podcast today mm-hmm. you can find us on pretty much all of the major podcast platforms including apple podcast spotify google podcast iheart radio amazon music and stitcher you can watch the videos um uh on YouTube at uh, youtube.com uh, C slash prophetic perspective. You can also find us on Instagram and Facebook as well. You can make contact with us at info at prophetic perspective.org or find us on prophetic perspective.org on the web and also reach us on telegram. And so this is the end of season one. This was the final episode of season one. Yes. Brother, thank you for your help, man. It's really been a blessing. It. It's been eye-opening. It was, and a, it was an exciting journey. It's exciting, yes. Yeah, and we we got some testimonies from people whose lives have been changed and Amen. touched. And wow, what a wonderful experience to know that as we have gone through these prophecies and explanations that uh, people's lives have been affected positively yes. by this. And so may God bless you. Thank you for following. And so for the, for the next uh, while, we're going to do something else. Yes. And then after that, uh, Marla and myself will return for a next season. And so please uh, subscribe. Make sure you get the notifications from this channel on YouTube. But also, if you're listening to this on a podcast, Please subscribe to whatever platform you're listening on and make sure you get the notifications for whatever will be put out. And so we will continue studying scripture as we go along. And we will be preparing now also for the next series that we will have. Yes. But in the meantime, stay in God's word, please. stay studying. Yes. And please share this with people. You know, go back, restudy, re listen, re watch, share it with people, and make sure that God's word and God's truth get out for this time. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word. And for the word that was made flesh, Jesus Christ, who came and died for our sins. Thank you, Lord, that you have warned us of the many deceptions that will come upon the earth. Mm -hmm. Um, And we know that your coming is eminent, is Mm -hmm. sure. And Lord, so I pray that these podcasts will continue to be a blessing to Mm -hmm. the listeners and that they will continue to have a desire to read your word. Mm -hmm. Please save us in your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.